Along Potter's scattered line, the order was passed from man to man, but some of them off in the brush didn't get the word, and some wouldn't believe it when they did. They kept fighting on their own, mostly alone, one man with a rifle trying for one more shot at the enemy before they got him. A corporal crawling along the line brought the news to Private First Class Breckenridge and his pal, Private First Class Wallace. Breckenridge had lost his bet that they would never see the sun rise, and then he had bet they would never see it set. Now Wallace said, Breck, I guess you're going to win that second bet. They took the bolts from their rifles and flung them as far off into the brush as they could. If the Japanese wanted to use those rifles, they'd have to do some hunting first. They sat down to wait for the Japanese to come for them. Private First Class Wallace remembers he took out the letter he had carried through the battle. The letter from his girl in Pennsylvania, telling him how happy she was that he was in the Pacific, where he would not be in danger. He slowly tore it into little pieces and let them blow out of his hand. Neither of them said anything as they sat watching the tiny bits of paper scatter over the sand. At the artillery positions, blankets were stuffed into the muzzles of the guns and the guns were fired. To make sure the enemy could never repair the damaged guns, marines then dropped grenades into the muzzles. They cut all cables, broke gun dials, destroyed the firing locks. Lieutenant Lewis's battery used 20 pistol shots to make sure their director and height finder were damaged beyond repair. Sergeant Robert Box was firing his .45 into the height finder when a bullet ricocheted and hit him. He turned the air blue with his comments on the luck that would bring a man through a battle and let him wound himself when it was over. When their weapons and equipment were wrecked, the Marines on Peel Island and Peacock Point sat down to gorge themselves to eat up as much as they could of their food supply before the Japanese came for them. There was no sense saving food now, and it might be their last meal. About forty minutes after the first word to surrender had been given, Lieutenant Lewis marched his men to the command post and reported, Sir, the guns and fire control equipment of E-Battery have been destroyed. He kept his tired, streaked face expressionless, but his men stood staring at the white flag over the command post, a bedsheet nailed to a timber, and there was bewilderment and resentment in their faces. They could hear firing up ahead, the fight was still going on, and they had been ordered to destroy their guns and quit. I told them, I don't know whether any Marines have ever surrendered before, but those are the orders and they'll be carried out. As they relaxed, sitting down to wait for the Japanese or sprawling wearily on the ground, somebody asked what the Japanese would do with them. Sergeant Gragg said, If they don't shoot us, we'll probably go to Manchukuo and work in the salt mines. A private first class drawled, Join the Marines and see the world the hard way. Somebody laughed. Somebody broke out a small supply of hoarded chocolate bars. They had to break the bars in half to make them go around, but there was no use saving them now, so they waited, munching candy, for the Japanese to come. Meanwhile, Platoon Sergeant Bernard Kettner came to the command post on an errand from the firing line. He must have stood watching me as I worked at the phone, but I did not notice him until he stepped up to me and stuck out his hand. He said, Don't worry, Major. You fought a good fight and did all you could. We shook hands, and then the sergeant trudged back to the line and I picked up the telephone again. I knew the enemy's advance units were near the military hospital, which was between my command post and the enemy. I had called Dr. Khan, the Navy doctor, to raise a white flag and give word of the surrender to a Japanese officer, if he could manage contact with one. Now my phone man turned from the switchboard. Sir, the hospital doesn't answer. I spoke to a group. Rig a white flag you can carry. We'll have to go down there. A sergeant, Donald Malik, volunteered, and tied a white rag on a swab handle, and the two of us started walking down the road toward the enemy. We didn't know it, but the Japanese already had captured the hospital. They celebrated the capture by firing into the crowded dugout, killing a civilian and wounding a naval officer. Then they herded the sick and wounded out of the hospital and prodded them into lines along the road. Before Sergeant Malik and I reached the hospital, we met the Japanese point, the leading man of their advance. We stopped in the middle of the road and Sergeant Malik held up his white flag. The Japanese came towards us with slow caution, covering us with his rifle, finger on the trigger. He stopped a few feet from us, his fixed bayonet ready to lunge, and peered at us, 
He could not help seeing the insignia of my rank on my shirt collar. He motioned with his bayonet, making me understand I must drop my helmet and pistol belt and empty my pockets on the ground. He let me keep my handkerchief and wallet, nothing else. He made Malik do the same. He even made Malik take off his shirt and leave it on the ground. Then he stepped aside and motioned with his bayonet for us to precede him toward the Japanese lines. He followed a few paces behind us. We had gone only a few steps when we saw the second man of the Japanese advance party waiting in the road. As we approached him, a rifle cracked in the brush. The Japanese fell on his face. I yelled, The order has been given to cease firing and damn it you'll obey that order. The shot must have been fired by one of Potter S. men who failed to get the word and failed to see our white the men from Mars flag in the brush. Our guard only motioned us to walk on to the fallen man. He stooped and rolled the body over. He saw the man was dead, but he showed neither pity nor anger. He simply motioned for us to move on. The Japanese had cleared the hospital when we reached it. There were about thirty Americans, wounded, sick and able-bodied, and all had been stripped down to their skivvies and shoes. Now they sat in four rows beside the road with eight machine guns at their backs. Their hands were lashed behind them with telephone wire, and one end of the wire was noosed around each man's neck. If he tried to free his hands or even ease the strain of the wire cutting into his wrists, he would tighten the noose around his neck. Several Japanese were standing at the hospital door watching us approach. One of them was wearing a sword, so I knew he was an officer. I asked him, Do you speak English? The reply was yes. Well, we are surrendering. His face lit up. He said something to his men and then gave me a cigarette. He was trying to act nonchalant, but I think he was only trying to hide his fear that our surrender was a trick. I asked, Where did you learn English? Studied at school at San Francisco Word Fair, 1939. Somebody yelled excitedly, and we saw that a Japanese sentry had stopped one of our trucks. Commander Cunningham got out and walked toward us. I was surprised to see he had changed to his formal blue uniform. The Japanese officer, a Navy lieutenant, junior grade, looked from Cunningham to me undecidedly. Who number one? he asked. I pointed to Cunningham. I said that while he arranged the formal surrender, I would go around the island with Malik to be sure that everybody got the word to surrender. The World's Fair junior grade and about twenty troops escorted us back to the command post, where I made sure that all our men in the vicinity were disarmed. Then we started walking toward Camp One. As we crossed the airstrip, we met the commander of the Japanese landing force, a navy captain. He had been wounded in the hand. He shook his head when I asked if he spoke English, but he handed me a pad and pencil. I knew many Japanese can read and write English without speaking it, so I scribbled, I will stop the fighting. I left further explanation to the World's Fair junior grade. Another Japanese junior grade joined our party as we started on. I made the usual inquiry. Did he speak English? In perfect English he replied, No, I do not speak English. Do you speak Japanese? He walked directly behind me. He kept swinging his sword as though anxious to use it. It was about 9.30am, seven hours since I had lost communication with my forward positions. Now we came to Hannah's gun, the three-inch gun he had volunteered to man for beach defence when the enemy started landing. When Major Putnam's sparse line defending the gun was broken by the irresistible force of numbers, thirteen marines and civilians rallied around Hannah's gun for a last stand. They were surrounded. The enemy swept the position with heavy fire. From the safe shelter of revetments built for our planes, the Japanese dropped a pounding rain of rifle grenades on the defenders. Three of the thirteen defenders of the gun were killed, and nine were wounded. Only Captain Tharin was still unhit, but he and the nine wounded men were still holding at bay at least two hundred Japanese when I climbed onto a revetment and yelled to them. This is Major Devereux. The island has been surrendered. Cease firing. Put down your weapons. There was no answer. I shouted again and walked closer. Our men could see me now. I walked closer, calling that the island had surrendered. Now a few of them were coming out to meet me. Major Putnam looked like hell itself. He had been shot in the jaw. His face was a red smear. He said, Jimmy, I'm sorry, poor Hank is dead. Elrod had been a fury. Men remembered how one charge almost overwhelmed them, and how Hank Elrod stood upright, 
blasting with a Tommy gun and broke the charge. Japanese fell that time close enough for him to touch. A man remembers Elrod saying, kill them. They remember he was standing up to throw a grenade when a Japanese shot him. The Japanese had crawled in among the enemy dead, scattered thickly around the position and waited there for his chance. Somebody killed the Japanese, but Elrod never knew it. He died instantly. Now he lay there with his eyes open, defiant, and the grenade still tightly clutched in his hand. With him at the gun died Robert Bryan and Paul Gay, civilian volunteers. The Japanese separated Major Putnam, Captain Tharin and Lieutenant Hanna from the men, and left both groups under guard while the rest of us walked on toward Camp 1. We stumbled on another siege at the generator pit, where Lieutenant Cleaver and his three sergeants were still trying to blow up the airstrip. The four marines were still alternately beating off Japanese attacks and working on their stalled generator, trying to get it started so they could explode the dynamite buried under the strip. They held their fire when they saw me approaching with Malik and the white flag. The Japanese were a little behind us. I stopped and called to them that the island had been surrendered. One of the sergeants grabbed Cleaver's arm. Don't surrender, Lieutenant. It's a hoax. Marines never surrender. But finally, Cleaver shook his head and stood wearily up. The escort party took Cleaver's detail under guard and we went on. It occurred to me to thank God in my heart that Cleaver had not succeeded in blowing up the airstrip while we were crossing it. Even if we had escaped the explosion, the Japanese would have murdered us all for what they would have considered an act of treachery. We gathered in the crews of 2.50 calibre machine guns, still holding out at the end of the airfield, and then pushed on toward the sound of small arms fire in the direction of Camp 1. We came up behind 50 or 60 Japanese in a firefight with troops we could not see. The Japanese were getting the worst of it. They were giving ground when they saw us. Our white flag was flying plainly, but some of the Japanese swung around and fired at us. A bunch of them, a couple of dozen maybe, charged us with bayonets. The sword-swinging junior grade stepped forward, shouting at them until they stopped the charge, but then he let them jostle us around, pushing and pulling us, making us turn out our pockets. They didn't seem to want anything we had, not even as a souvenir. They just thumbed through our things and threw them away, money and everything else, among the rest my wallet containing my only photograph of my wife and my son. Now we could see the marines who were pushing back the Japanese, Poindexter and perhaps twenty of his reserve. Poindexter's idea had been to fight his way back toward the airfield, driving the Japanese before him, until he could hit the flank of the main Japanese force driving inland toward the command post. Now he saw us standing there with the white flag and a bunch of Japanese. He was grinning as he came down the road. He thought the Japanese were our prisoners. The truth seemed to stun him. His reaction was like that of many men I have seen under emotion too strong for expression in any words. He snapped his fingers and said, Oh! We marched on, picking up prisoners in driblets. The guards were making us walk with our hands in the air. But the World's Fair junior grade told us, Put them down. When he dropped back to the rear of the column, a guard hit me sharply with his bayonet and motioned for me to put up my hands again. I obeyed, but the junior grade came back and told me to put them down. He and the guard argued back and forth, countermanding each other, while I wondered if this example of discipline was typical of the Japanese military. It was. Our flag was still flying from the water tower at Camp 1, where we had hoisted the colours when the flagpole was shot down. When the Japanese saw the flag, some of them broke into a run, cheering and yelling, and one of the Japanese began climbing the tower. I looked at my men. They were staring at the Japanese with burning eyes. Fists were clinching. They were at the breaking point, the crazy point where a man will go against a gun with bare hands. I snapped, hold it, keep your heads, all of you. They could only get themselves killed if they tried to stop the Japanese. So we stood watching while the grinning Japanese on the tower cut our colours down, stuffed them in a camouflage net and climbed back to the ground with his prize. Platoon Sergeant Dave J. Rush did not know about the surrender when he caught sight of the Japanese climbing the water tower to cut down the flag. Sergeant Rush told me later that he drew a perfect bead with a machine gun on the climbing Japanese, but fortunately held his fire for a few seconds and then saw the surrender party. Otherwise, it would have been extremely embarrassing to us.
Gunnery Sergeant John Semeris was at a .30 caliber machine gun near the small boat channel and didn't see us either, but he did see a Japanese dive bomber swooping in. Semeris opened up with his gun. A .30 caliber is normally used for ground defense, but Semeris bagged the Japanese. I saw the Japanese jettison his bombs and later we learned that the plane crashed. It was beautiful shooting, but it made things a little ticklish for us, because our Japanese escort also saw it, but they only prodded us onto the small boat channel. I had been unable to order the dynamite-laden barge blown up in the channel after communications failed. The civilian volunteer assigned to the exploder had been unwilling to assume the responsibility of destroying the channel without orders. I told the sword-swinging lieutenant about the dynamite barge. Nothing could be gained now by trying to hide it, and an accidental explosion might cause the Japanese to massacre us. I thought our job was finished when we reached the channel, but the sword-swinger said it wasn't. He led us to the boat dock and told me we had to go across the channel. That was when I learned that Marines still held Wilkes Island. I suppose Saga may seem too big a word for the fight of Captain Piat's small detachment of Marines on Wilkes Island, but I have thought about it for four years, and I cannot think of a better word for what they did. Captain Piat, a casual South Carolinian, had 60 Marines to defend Wilkes, 60 men to defend an island one mile long and one-eighth of a mile in width. His five-inch battery, commanded by Lieutenant McAllister, was emplaced near Cuckoo Point. His three-inch guns, commanded by Gunner McKinstry, lacked any fire control equipment and were set up for beach defence about midway along the shore. Along the beach between the three-inch position and Cuckoo Point, there were four .50 calibre machine gun emplacements, while .30 calibre machine guns were spotted on the lagoon side of the island and also to cover the seaward entrance of the small boat channel. Captain Piat had six men at his command post near the middle of the island, not far from the searchlight position. When the first false report of a landing on Peel Island came over the air raid warning network, Captain Piat ordered Lieutenant McAllister to send one section of five-inch men to reinforce the machine guns defending the lagoon side, while the rest of the battery deployed as infantry along the seaward beach. They waited. It was too dark to see the man next to you, and rain squalls whipped across the island. At 1.20am, Gunner McKinstry telephoned from the three-inch position. Captain, I think I hear a motor turning over. Could he see anything? Not a damn thing, but I'm sure it's there. I can hear it. The sound was faint, muffled by the sea and the intermittent rain. There was a chance that tracer bullets might give light enough to reveal whatever was in the darkness just offshore. So Captain Piat ordered the .50s to fire at the sound. Those were the first shots of the last day's battle. It was about that time that the Japanese destroyers were sighted racing in toward the reef on Wake Proper. The streaking light of the tracer fire showed McAllister a big landing boat close to the beach. It was coming in. He called Platoon Sergeant Bedell, bull-voiced Bedell. Send two men to grenade that boat, Bedell said, yes, sir. But instead of sending two men to the beach down there in the darkness to try to smash the Japanese landing before they got ashore, Bedell told Private First Class William Bueller, Come along. With all the grenades they could carry, they ran toward the beach, stumbling in the sand, trying to get into water close enough to the landing boat to toss in their grenades, but the boat was already grating in the shallows. Bedell hurled a grenade. It fell short. The Japanese were coming ashore, blasting the darkness with fire. Bedell and Bueller could not get close enough to throw their grenades into the boat, but they kept trying. They stood in the path of the advance, throwing their grenades at the crowded beach the Japanese were trying to cross, until Bedell fell and Bueller, wounded, was out of grenades. Then Private First Class Bueller stumbled back through the bullet-splashed darkness to McAllister. Sir, they got Bedell. He's dead. Private First Class Bueller did not bother to mention that he was wounded. He took his place in the line. The Japanese were coming in from the beach with bayonets. The point fifties were raising hell, the tracers spearing fire through the windy darkness. But for each man in that line, the battle was only what happened on the ground where he stood. He could not see what was to the left or to the right or even in front of him until a yelling shape came lunging out of the dark, close enough almost to touch. One marine saw a dim figure spring out of the darkness. He lunged with his bayonet. They both fell, the marine and the Japanese, 
each with the other's bayonet in his body. But the line held. The charge broke. For those men, the battle became a deadly game of blind man's buff, the Japanese and Marines firing at the flash of each other's rifles in the night. In the meantime, while Private First Class Bueller was throwing his last grenade, Captain Piat telephoned me for permission to illuminate. Permission granted. The searchlight went on, making the beach like day, and the Marines saw that the landing boat was ashore in front of the three-inch gun position. The Japanese were pouring ashore, deploying, moving with fixed bayonets. The light lasted hardly a minute, then blackness again. Technical Sergeant E. F. Hassig reported to Piat that the light was dead. It had never functioned properly after being blown over in the earlier bombings. That was when communications failed between my command post and Wilkes Island. From that time on, I did not know what was happening on Wilkes, and Captain Piat did not know what was happening anywhere else. His communications were cut not only with Wake Proper, but with McAllister and McKinstry. The only line he still had was to the point fifty calibre machine guns, and now Private First Class S.K. Ray was reporting, Captain, they're all around me. Could he keep the gun in action? We can try, sir. There was a wild burst of firing. The Japanese were rushing Ray's gun, then silenced. Private First Class Ray picked up the phone he had dropped and reported, We're still here, sir. Piat called Sergeant Raymond Coulson and told him the point fifties had to be kept firing as long as possible. An enlisted man later described Sergeant Coulson as regulation as hell, hot-tempered as hell, and always trying to get extra chow for his men. Now Sergeant Coulson moved out in the darkness with two or three men to try to keep the Japanese from closing in on his guns. It was nasty work in the dark, but he kept the guns firing, hitting blindly at the flank of the main Japanese attack. That attack was driving straight inland from the beach to take McKinstry's three-inch gun position. The searchlight had lasted long enough for Gunner McKinstry to see that the main attack was being laid right in his lap. He didn't have riflemen enough to stop the Japanese. The enemy was so close that the three-inch gun could not be depressed low enough for direct hits on the boat or the beach, so McKinstry cut his fuses so short that the shots were almost muzzle blast. That fire smashed the enemy's frontal attack, but the Japanese kept up heavy fire into the position as they crawled closer and closer in the shrouding darkness, as snipers crawled inland far enough to fire into McKinstry's flanks. Now they were close enough to lob grenades into the position. They were closing in, almost surrounding him, and all McKinstry's men could see of the enveloping enemy were the flashes when they fired. So McKinstry ordered his gunners to remove the firing locks from the guns, then they fell back in the darkness to infantry position deeper inland. The Japanese moved into the three-inch position. They tried to press farther into the island, but McKinstry's riflemen knocked them back. There, too, the battle became a blindfolded duel. At 4.30am, lacking communication with McAllister and McKinstry, Captain Piat started on a personal reconnaissance, slipping through the darkness to find his men to try to prepare for the redoubled attack he knew would come with daylight. On the lagoon side, there had been no fighting. Now, in the early dimness, a private first class saw a Japanese officer walking along the shore. Apparently, he had pushed ahead of his men to the lagoon on a checkup. The private first class watched him a while and then inquired, Say, Sergeant, there's a Japanese officer down there. Shall I shoot him? Platten Sergeant Joe Stowe exploded. Hell yes, you damn fool, or give me that rifle and do it. The private first class did it. In that early light, Japanese flags were seen in a line directly across Wilkes Island. Those were the flags reported to me. They apparently had been set up by the Japanese, so that the dive bombers which attacked us as soon as it was light enough would not bomb their own troops. The bulk of the Japanese were massed in the three-inch position, which gave them good cover while their flanks were covered by riflemen and machine guns concealed behind scattered piles of coral. They still heavily outnumbered the marines, but Captain Piat decided to take them before they started taking him. Lieutenant McAllister combined forces with Gunner McKinstry, a total of perhaps 25 marines, and began a frontal attack on the Japanese position. Their advance was checked by Japanese firing from behind a big rock. Their fire could not dislodge the Japanese, and Gunner McKinstry started forward to scale the rock, but McAllister stopped him. Detail a man for that job, he said. 
Before McKinstry could reply, Corporal William C. Halstead started forward. He said, I got it, Gunner. McAllister's men kept up a brisk fire at the side of the rock to keep the enemy pinned down, while Corporal Halstead went forward. The corporal climbed the rock, pitched grenades down on the Japanese and finished them off with his rifle. Then he waved to the others to come on. They moved forward beyond the rock against a slashing fire. That was where Corporal Halstead was killed, going forward. Meanwhile, Captain Piat had rounded up the crews of two .30 caliber machine guns and eight riflemen. He led them to a position in the rear of the enemy position and there divided his little force, sending Corporal John S. Johnson Jr. with one gun to the left while he took the other gun to the right. The sound of firing told him that McAllister and McKinstry were assaulting the enemy's front. Because of the short distance to those marines, Piat ordered his men to fire only at targets identified as enemy. Fire short bursts, he ordered, and keep moving. They hit the Japanese from two directions in the rear, firing at ranges of less than 50 yards, blasting their way in to meet the marines attacking from the front. In front of the Japanese, McAllister swung part of the men to hit the enemy's flank, while McKinstry kept going forward with the rest. From the cover of rocks, the Japanese maintained a scathing fire, but the Marines kept advancing. A few Japanese played possum among the dead and tried to bayonet Marines as they passed. McKinstry ordered, Be sure the dead ones are dead. After that, the possum players got nobody. The Marines kept advancing with the bayonet until they met in the Japanese position and swept it clean. Captain Piat reorganised his force and swept the island, but the enemy's resistance was over. The Japanese on Wilkes had been exterminated by a force half their number. The Japanese had put 100 or more men on Wilkes, and the only live Japanese on the island when Piat finished mopping up were a couple of hog-tied prisoners and one Japanese who was playing dead. It was 7.40am. The dive bombers hit them, blasting and strafing, while the helpless marines hugged the deck. At 8am, ships were seen moving in southwest of Wilkes, and Captain Piat ordered McAllister to reorganise his battery as artillery and to fire at the ships if they came within range. Piat's men tore down the Japanese flags, but our observers did not report this to me. Captain Piat still did not know what was happening on Wake or Peel. Over the air raid warning network, he managed to get in touch with the garage at Camp 1, but all they could tell him was that there was fighting toward the airfield, that there had been no communication with my command post since soon after the battle began. About noon, still under dive bombing attack, Piat's watchers reported a destroyer had moved in only 2,000 yards from the channel entrance and that several other ships were within 4,000 yards offshore. Piat ordered McAllister's five-inch guns to engage the enemy, but McAllister reported that both guns had been knocked out by bombs. They could not be repaired. Watchers reported a considerable number of small boats moving in toward Wake near the channel. Lacking artillery to fire on them, Captain Piat gathered all the men he could and ordered an advance to the channel as infantry to repel the boats. As they trudged wearily through the coral and brush, the dive bombers attacked them again. Private First Class Robert L. Stevens was killed. He was the last Marine casualty of the Battle of Wake Island. Meanwhile, as Piat's dog-tired men slogged toward the channel, we were crossing to Wilkes Island in a launch. The sword-swinging junior grade had about 30 Japanese to guard us, but he made sure that Sergeant Malik and I were up forward with our white flag. When we landed on Wilkes, I shouted, This is Major Devereux. The island has been surrendered. Put down your arms. Nobody answered. We walked slowly along the beach, Malik and I in the lead with our white flag. The Japanese fingered their rifles nervously as they followed. I shouted, The island has been surrendered. Don't try any monkey business. There was no answer. We heard nobody, saw nobody. The only sign of life was the Japanese shipping offshore. Destroyers as well as landing craft from the big ships were closing in. Though I did not know it, those were the boats that Piat's men were coming to repel with rifles and machine guns. I saw a flash from one of the destroyers. A shell burst at the water's edge. A moment later a second shell exploded. It was nearer. We were the target. Sergeant Malik and I kept walking straight ahead. We knew we ought to hit the deck, but without saying a word we were both damned if we would duck while the sword-swinging junior grade was on his feet.
We kept walking. The third shell burst within fifty yards of us. I wanted to crawl into a hole. I am sure Sergeant Malik must have wished the same thing. But we kept walking. We were scared, but we could not show it before the Japanese. Then the Japanese junior grade did what he should have done at the first shot. He told all hands to take shelter and ordered a signalman to give the destroyer the word to cease fire. I hey never been more relieved than when that Japanese officer took cover so I could too. After the signalman had stopped the destroyer's fire, we went on. I kept calling out from time to time that the island had surrendered, but we were halfway to Cuckoo Point before I saw any troops. A few grubby, dirty men who came out of the brush with their rifles ready, sullen-eyed, unwilling to believe even when they heard me call that we had surrendered. A moment later, Captain Piat appeared with his officers. I told them, we have surrendered. Piat was looking at me. His mouth was a tight line. He said, yes, sir. The irrepressible Piat was soon kidding with our captors as we moved on to the three-inch gun position where so many of the Japanese had been slaughtered. When we reached the position, the Japanese started jabbering as they stared at the litter of dead. Hearing them, one of the corpses stood up. He was wounded, not seriously, and he had been playing dead. He fawned over us, but he was different when I saw him later on a stretcher. Somebody had given me a canteen and I offered him a drink of water, but he pushed the canteen aside contemptuously. He was among hundreds of his own people then, and by this time he knew we were helpless, so he wanted to show how tough he was. At Piat's command post, the Japanese released the two prisoners. One of them burst into tears and ran to a dead Japanese sprawled on the coral. He kept sobbing and saying, My brother, my brother, several hundred Japanese under a full lieutenant landed on Wilkes from the boats Piat had been going to meet. Our sword-swinging junior grade giggled a lot as he made his report, apparently feeling pretty good that we had not run into trouble, but his superior was not amused. The lieutenant kept scowling at us. I imagine he had learned how many men that day's work had cost them. One of the officers ordered Gunner McKinstry to get into a truck. McKinstry asked me, what are they going to do? Shoot me? I said, nonsense, you've got nothing to worry about. He had not had a minute's sleep for 24 hours. Now the Japanese started him to work, driving him for another 24 hours, and whenever he dozed off, they woke him up with a bayonet. When we reached the channel where the prisoners were being gathered for transportation to wake proper, I saw one of Piat's men who was desperately wounded. Piat asked the Japanese officer to let him be taken to wake for medical attention at once, but the Japanese pretended not to understand and kept the wounded marine there until all the prisoners were gathered. When at last we did cross the channel, Piat found some officers who spoke a little English and urged them to let us send the badly wounded man ahead to the hospital. They only shrugged. They made plain they were not concerned about our wounded. They had wounded of their own to care for. Piat spied a Japanese with a big black sword strapped to his back and exclaimed, Whew, Major, look at that! I wonder what it's for! I guessed it was an executioner's sword, but Piat asked the Japanese, What's that for? The Japanese just grinned. We saw the Japanese landing force commander, the Navy captain with the wounded hand, talking to Commander Cunningham and Commander Keane. When they got in a truck with some other American officers, Piat, McAllister and I climbed in after them. Nobody tried to stop us. We drove to the Japanese headquarters near Hannah's Gun, where the Japanese commander continued to question Cunningham and Keane. Commander Keane was drawing diagrams to show Wake's facilities for food, water, shelter and so on, when the Japanese commander interrupted him by taking the pad and pencil to write one question. Where are women's quarters? Keane wrote, No women on island. The Japanese commander looked at him as though Keane had announced that black was white. The Japanese officers offered us some canned food. It was now about 2pm and I had not eaten since 6 o'clock the night before, so even that raw fish tasted good. But as I ate it, I felt dead inside. Maybe it was partly exhaustion. I had just walked six miles under guard, most of the time with my hands in the air, and my body ached from weariness and from lack of sleep. But I do not think that was the reason I felt as I did. I think it was simply that at last the full realisation came of what had happened. We had done our best, and it had not been good enough, it was what I have called the death of pride.
I suppose you could call it despair. They were marching prisoners toward us now. Most of the men were stripped to their skivvies. Some had lost even their shoes and were limping barefooted on the coral. They were exhausted, hungry, dirty, and there was no hope. They had been shambling along, trailing after Sergeant Hassig, a barrel-chested man whose pride in life was his stripes and his bushy moustache. It was a regular guard's moustache, and it bristled as he told the straggling men, Snap out of this stuff. God damn it, you're marines. A few moments later, they passed where we were eating our raw fish. Sergeant Hassig was at right guide, shoulders back, moustache defiant. And the men, weary scarecrows, were marching in perfect cadence, heads up and eyes front, stepping out like a regiment on parade. The Japanese guards had to trot to keep up with them. I felt pride at the sight of them marching by, at the bewilderment on the faces of the Japanese officers standing with me. The Japanese never did understand. As they used to say, but you don't act like prisoners. It was an expensive victory for the Japanese. By their own admission, Wake Island cost them 11 naval ships, 29 planes, and more than 5,700 men killed. The American losses were a dozen planes and 96 dead, our dead included 46 marines, 47 civilians and three sailors. In the final attack on December 23, the Japanese admitted the loss of one destroyer and 350 dead. This was in addition to the two destroyers which they beached and which were gutted by Lieutenant Hanna's fire. The American loss in the final attack was 26 dead, including a dozen civilians. While the Japanese were still rounding us up, even before the order to surrender had reached all hands, it became apparent that the Japanese had a list of all American officers on Wake Island. It was mimeographed in Japanese, but I heard them checking it, and the last name on the list, where it would normally have appeared in a similar fist of our own, was that of Gunnar Hamas. I learned much later one method Japanese agents in Hawaii used to keep track of ship and troop movements. They used Japanese girls who regularly invited servicemen to picnics and parties. They saw to it that the servicemen had a good time so they would be eager to come again. Thus, when none of the men from a particular ship or unit appeared for a picnic, the Japanese agents would know that that ship or that unit had left Hawaii. When members of the ship's crew again appeared for their regular dates, the spies would know the ship had returned. The time the ship had been gone, and its type usually enabled them to make a shrewd guess where it had gone, and frequently what it had been doing. If the members of land units disappeared at the same time, the spies could guess with a good chance of accuracy where those units had gone. I am not suggesting that this was the method by which the Japanese learned the names of the officers on Wake Island, because I have no idea how they did pull the trick. All I know is that despite the fact we all came to Wake under secret orders and at several different times, the Japanese apparently did have a list of officers on the island, the Japanese were especially interested in Captain Wilson, the army officer in charge of the radio trailer. They had him listed for special attention for something that had happened in 1939, when a Japanese naval training vessel was docked in Hawaii. Captain Wilson, then a civilian customs inspector, attempted to board the Japanese vessel, but was halted on the dock by an arrogant sentry. The sentry insisted that Wilson bow low and salute the Japanese flag, Wilson drew his pistol and drove the sentry ahead of him as he boarded the ship without a bow or a salute. The Japanese consul apologised profusely for the incident, but the Japanese didn't forget Wilson, and after the surrender on Wake two years later, they called him to account for the insult. A Japanese officer informed him, You are responsible for the war between Nippon and the United States. You stirred up animosity. For that you will be decapitated. Captain Wilson started talking for his life. He insisted that the Wilson they wanted was another Wilson, explaining that Wilson was a very common name among Americans, like Smith or Jones or Brown. His clinching argument was, the Wilson in Hawaii was a civilian customs inspector, but I am an army officer. The Japanese admitted there was no doubt that the Wilson they wanted was a civilian customs inspector, nor was there any doubt that the prisoner Wilson was an army officer. The only logical conclusion was that the two could not be the same person, even though they had the same initials, and so the Japanese let Captain Wilson live. The Japanese have very few family names, so the coincidence seemed quite understandable to them. By sunset that day, December 23, 
All the Americans on Wake had been rounded up. Ten of us were separated from the others and confined in the one-room cottage we called the White House. Sergeant Malik was the only enlisted man among the ten. Ten men crowded the single room, but we were too exhausted to care. We were sprawled out, each man thinking his own bitter thoughts, too tired to talk, when our guard snapped to attention at the door. A Japanese admiral walked in, resplendent in stiffly starched whites with a lot of decorations and a sword. We were told he was the commander of the task force which had taken the island. He looked at us sternly as we stood up. Then he handed a paper to Commander Cunningham, who read it aloud. We kept a copy of it. Proclamation. Here it is proclaimed that the entire islands of Wake are now the state property of the Great Empire of Japan. Public notice. The Great Empire of Japan, who loves peace and respects justice, has been obliged to take arms against the challenge of President Roosevelt. Therefore, in accordance with the peace-loving spirit of the Great Empire of Japan, Japanese Imperial Navy will not inflict any harms on those people, though they have been our enemy, who do not hold hostility against us in any respect. So they be in peace, but whoever violates our spirit, or whoever are not obedient, shall be severely punished by our martial law, issued by the headquarters of Japanese Imperial Navy. We noticed two curious things about the Admiral's proclamation. First, in both places where the word Navy appeared, it had been written on a tiny bit of paper and carefully pasted over some other word, presumably army. Second, the phrase those people obviously referred to a native population, though Wake had none and the Japanese must have known that as well as we did. It was just an attempt to blow up their victory to a bigger size for propaganda at home. This was as they did, in fact, in newspaper articles which referred to Camp 1 and Camp 2 as cities captured by the valorous Japanese navy in the conquest of Wake. When Commander Cunningham finished reading the proclamation, we sat down and lit cigarettes. Somebody offered the Japanese admiral a cigarette, but he angrily waved it aside. He stood glaring at us, outraged at our lack of reaction to the proclamation, and doubtless at our failure to stand submissively awaiting his pleasure. He took his peeve out on the sentry with an explosive harangue in Japanese, and every time he had to pause for breath, the sentry gave him a bow and yelped, Hi! We gathered that meant, Aye, aye, sir. The admiral finally got tired of talking and stalked out, and the sentry relaxed at the door. Even then, as we fell asleep under the sentry's eye, I think most of us expected to be rescued. We knew that ships were due next day to evacuate the civilians, and we still assumed they would be part of a task force bringing us reinforcements. But the next day, the only ships we saw were the vessels of the Japanese force around the island. Our Christmas dinner at the White House consisted of crackers and evaporated milk. A long time later, I learned that we were right in assuming that an American task force had been on its way to wake. The task force, built around the aircraft carrier Saratoga, was only 24 hours from wake when we surrendered. The force was ordered to turn back. The Navy had too little left after Pearl Harbor to gamble the ships on an attempt to retake Wake. They wrote us off. I have been told that when they saw the task force was turning back without striking a blow at the Japanese force around Wake Island, pilots on the Saratoga sat down on the flight deck and cried. The ten of us in the White House were not allowed to communicate with the other prisoners, but we were fed fairly well and were not abused, so we assumed that the other prisoners were being similarly treated. We did not learn how wrong we were until a note was smuggled into us by a prisoner bringing our food the day after Christmas. Then we learned of the reasonless brutality to which our comrades were being subjected. I have mentioned how prisoners were partly stripped as they surrendered, many being stripped down to their underwear, and how their hands were bound behind them with telephone wire. Their tightly bound hands were pulled high up their backs so that the muscles ached. Then one end of the wire was noosed around their necks, so they would choke themselves if they tried to free their hands, or even tried to lessen the tortuous strain. Some were left bound even after every American on the island had been rounded up, and all were safely under guard. Even sick and wounded, even some still bleeding, were trussed like the others and herded along as the Japanese packed scores of prisoners into the hospital dugouts, prodding them with bayonets. They were pushing them into space already so crowded there was hardly room for men to stand. Gunnar Hamas was one of them, and he says the place was packed to the point of suffocation.
Men fainted from lack of air, but the others could not help them, could not free bound hands to loosen the nooses that threatened to strangle the unconscious men. Men were vomiting on each other. There was no air, only stench. Gunnar Hamas had picked up a little Japanese while doing duty in Shanghai, and he risked a bayonet to call to an elderly Japanese officer strolling past the entrance. He asked the officer to free Dr. Khan so he could attend the wounded and a man who was dying. The Japanese replied in English, You doctor too? No, sir. Are you an officer? Yes, sir. The officer ordered sentries to free the doctor and gunner Hamas. He gave them a few cigarettes and matches. The doctor tried to aid the wounded and the sick, but there was little they could do in the crowded dugout except save the unconscious men from choking themselves to death. The elderly Japanese officer came back a little later and Hamas tackled him again. He showed him how badly the hands of the men were swollen from the pressure of the tight wire and the Japanese allowed him to loosen the wire around the prisoners' necks and hands. A little later, the Japanese allowed them to take off the wire and allowed some of the prisoners to leave the fetid dugout and sleep in the open, under guard. He also let Hamas gather up some clothing discarded in the road for the prisoners, though this angered a sentry, so he jabbed Hamas in the hip with his bayonet. Then the prisoners were moved to the airstrip. Most of those who left the stinking dugout had their underwear or little more. They dug with their bare hands into the hard-packed coral to make shallow holes so they would have some protection against the chilling wind. They had to work the next day, but they received no food. The Japanese cooked a meal for them and then deliberately let it spoil. The first water they got was brought in gasoline drums. The water was so tainted with gasoline that men retched as they forced themselves to drink. When the note telling of the treatment of the prisoners was smuggled to us at the White House, I wrote a letter to the commander of the Japanese landing force requesting that he give the other officers and men food, clothing and shelter. I showed the letter to Commander Keane because Commander Cunningham had been moved from the White House, leaving Commander Keane's senior officer present. It met with his approval. The Japanese commander did not answer my letter, but we learned soon afterward that the men had been moved into barracks and that they were being fed. Dr. Khan and Dr. Shark were allowed to move our sick and wounded to a building, but they had almost nothing with which to treat their patients. The Japanese had taken almost all of our medical supplies and showed no interest in whether the American patients lived or died. Not that their own wounded were very much better off. The Japanese had been praised for the efficiency of their sanitary corps during the Russo-Japanese War. But on wake, the Japanese medical men seemed to have no interest in even the rudiments of sanitation. Dr. Khan told me that the Japanese never destroyed a bloody bandage. They simply threw it out the window. As a result, the hospital was heavy with stench and swarmed with flies. Our men were not subjected to brutality after my protest, but there was the constant threat of execution over our heads. Typical was the time the Japanese ordered Dan Teeters to supervise the removal of dynamite we had buried under the airstrip. Teeters tried to explain that he had not buried it, and so he could not be sure he would find all the dynamite pockets. The Japanese officer wouldn't listen to excuses. You'd better find them all, the Japanese said. Don't forget we can stand you out there when we try the exploder. Captain Tharin, Gunnar Hamas and about 30 Marines were assigned the task of gathering our dead and burying them. Some of the dead had been placed in the reefer, but the refrigeration machinery had been knocked out by bombs and the bodies were badly decomposed. The men ordered to get those bodies were so hungry that in the stench-filled reefer they greedily ate the only food they found there, several big jars of maraschino cherries. Four years later, safe in the States, the taste of a maraschino cherry was enough to make Corporal Brown vomit. The dead were buried in a single grave near Hannah's gun. The men dug the grave four feet deep and laid the dead side by side in the trench. They covered the bodies with rubber ponchos, weighting down the ponchos with heavy chunks of coral, and then they filled the trench and made a long, low mound. The burial service was simple. The men who dug the grave stood bareheaded while somebody said a prayer and then the guards took them back. The Japanese were calling some of us from the White House for questioning every day. My first interrogation was by a smart Alec, whose need of a haircut told me that his commission was brand new, but he thought he was a bearcat at shrewd questioning.
he asked, How did you know the war had begun? We got a message from Pearl Harbor. How did you know we were going to attack Wake? We didn't know. Didn't you know our planes were coming? No. Well, how did you know they were coming? We didn't know until they arrived. Didn't you have any detection apparatus? You know what I mean? I knew he was hinting at radar and I answered, no, we had none at all. Then he screwed up his face ferociously and demanded, you must draw me a picture of such things. I couldn't help laughing. I said, me? I don't know anything about them. A child should have known it without asking, but I had to explain at length that such instruments required specially trained men to operate them, and that nobody who was not a specialist could give him a scientific description. He was finally convinced and sent me back to the White House. My interrogation by the task force commander's chief of staff struck me as almost equally silly. Wake Island had been Japanese for two weeks when he called me out to his car and asked me to show him where my guns were emplaced. I was not telling him anything he did not know already, so I pointed out the positions. But it took some time to convince the chief of staff I wasn't holding out on him. After I heard the questions he had asked other officers, it seemed obvious to me that even the Japanese top command could not understand the efficiency of our five-inch batteries. They were still worried by the suspicion that we must have larger guns hidden somewhere. All this time, despite guards and chain gang discipline and the danger of execution, the enlisted marines were still carrying on the war by sabotage. The Japanese gathered up all our weapons and put prisoners to work cleaning them, preparing the weapons for use by the Japanese. The marines submissively cleaned the rifles, polishing the outside of each rifle until it shone brightly enough for a presidential inspection, and then poured salt water down the barrels so the rifles would soon be useless. We had destroyed our fire control equipment, but some of the three-inch guns were still serviceable, and the Japanese were jubilant at these additions to the anti-aircraft defence they were installing. The marines assigned to clean these guns made them bright and shiny, and slipped sand into the recoil mechanism. Marines detailed to clean the captured machine guns managed to palm small vital parts, such as sears, and later threw them far into the brush. The guns looked beautiful, but they would not be much use in a battle. The Japanese found a supply of primers for the five-inch guns which had not been destroyed, and a Marine obligingly showed them how to use the primers. The Marine fired a primer, and the Japanese nodded sagely at the pop. So the Marine fired another and kept demonstrating how to use the primers until none was left. It makes a good tale now, and we can smile at the way the Japanese were fooled. But it was not amusing then. Each of those Marines gambled his life every time he palmed a seer or poured salt water down a rifle barrel. If he was caught or even suspected, he would have become a job for the Japanese executioner we saw now and then, stalking about with his big sword strapped to his back. Yet on the captured island, and afterward during the years our men were slaving in mines and on work projects in prison camps, their sabotage continued. They seemed always willing to risk their necks to get in another lick at the enemy. In the White House we learned little of this until much later. When we were not being interrogated, we were allowed to read, play cards, take short strolls under guard and wash our clothes. We tried to persuade the Japanese interpreter to let us rescue our toothbrushes from our gear, but he refused. There are many people in Japan who have no toothbrushes, he said. He bragged that he was a graduate of Columbia University, and maybe he was, but we called him garters because he wore socks and exposed Paris-style garters with his shorts. Whenever one of us was called for questioning, garters was in his glory. He would escort the prisoner to headquarters, swaggering along with a ferocious air, brandishing his pistol as though only he and his pistol prevented a general jailbreak. At night, when the island was blacked out, we tried to amuse ourselves by playing guessing games like Who Am I? or by talking with our succession of guards. They were all tough, husky men, and most of them were amiable and dumb as well. Almost every one of them would point at his nose, as an American might tap his chest and proclaim himself the judo champion of Japan by declaring, Me number one judo. They all were eager to exhibit their skill, but we refused because we knew we would lose face if we were thrown, or even if we had bodily contact. They were proud of the little English they had picked up, even though frequently they had no idea of the meaning of the phrases they parroted. One of them was always eager to recite over and over, 
as long as we would listen. God save our gracious king, long live our noble king, God save the king. We always told him his pronunciation was good, and he always beamed like a small boy receiving an unexpected ice cream cone. He had a rival who couldn't recite, but who made his bid for approval one night by giving a demonstration of Japanese scouting and patrolling, what we call sneaking and peeking. The Japanese stalked imaginary enemies around the room until Captain Piat said, Here, let me show you how the Americans do it. Piat held out his hand for the rifle, and the Japanese gave it to him. Our life in the White House was tedious and galling, but all of us were to look back on it as a time of comparative contentment and even luxury. We got an inkling of what was ahead on January 11, 1942, when they told us we were being shipped out next day on a prison ship. They posted this notice. Commander of the Prisoner Escort Navy of the Great Japanese Empire. Regulations for prisoners. The prisoners disobeying the following orders will be punished with immediate death. Those disobeying orders and instructions. Those showing a motion of antagonism and raising a sign of opposition. Those disordering the regulations by individualism, egoism, thinking only about yourself, rushing for your own goods. Those talking without permission and raising loud voices. Those walking and moving without order. Those carrying unnecessary baggage in embarking. Those resisting mutually. Those touching the boat's materials, wires, electric lights, tools, switches, etc. Those climbing ladder without order. Those showing action of running away from the room or boat. Those trying to take more meal than given to them. Those using more than two blankets. These twelve capital crimes were followed by five paragraphs of detailed instructions, ending on this hopeful note. Navy of the Great Japanese Empire will not try to punish you all with death. Those obeying all rules and regulations, and believing the action and purpose of the Japanese Navy, cooperating with Japan in constructing the new order of the Great Asia which leads to the world's peace will be well treated. Since immediate death was the punishment for taking unnecessary baggage aboard the prison ship, we asked Garters how much baggage was considered necessary. I don't know, Garters said. Well, does it mean one bag or two? I don't know, he said. Will you find out? No, I can't find out. Garters showed no more interest in the discussion. After all, it wasn't his neck. To be on the safe side, we decided that each of us would take only one bag. In mine I packed some underwear, socks and handkerchiefs, a raincoat, a pack of cards, a pair of shoes that didn't fit me, a toothbrush I had found and scalded, and an envelope containing personal papers. The landing force commander had examined the papers, which concerned only my family, and had put his chop on them, authorising me to take them. In addition to my bag, I had only the clothes I wore, khaki slacks and shirt, tennis shoes, a leather windbreaker, a battered sun helmet and a handkerchief in my pocket. We were forbidden to take even cigarettes. On the morning of January 12, the Japanese began loading enlisted men and civilians aboard the Nitamaru, a liner which had been converted into a prison ship. About three quarters of the civilians were being shipped with us, while the rest were remaining on wake with all the seriously wounded. Dr. Shark, the civilian doctor, whose courage and devotion to duty were outstanding through the battle, was one of the civilians left on wake. I have never since been able to find any trace of him, and I fear he may have been executed on the island. Late in the afternoon we were put aboard a landing craft. There I met Major Potter for the first time since the surrender. Most of the Americans we left on wake were subsequently shipped to Japanese prison camps. On the night of October 7, 1943, the Japanese lined up the Americans on the beach and murdered them with machine guns. Their excuse was that the 98 American civilians still on the island had established secret radio communication with United States naval forces. For this crime, the Japanese commander on wake, Rear Admiral Shigematsu Sakaibara, and 11 of his officers were sentenced to hang after trial by an American naval court at Kwajalein, following the Japanese capitulation. After my release, I had a meeting with Brigadier General Lawson Sanderson, United States Marine Corps, who took the surrender of Wake. I learned that it was apparent the Japanese on Wake were short of food due to constant patrolling by our submarine. To a Japanese, that would be reason enough to massacre prisoners. Well, 
Jimmy, here we are, don't look so glum. Things will be all right. I tried to act cheerful too, but I didn't feel it. We soon had still less reason to feel optimistic. When we came alongside the Nitamaru, a cargo net was lowered. We threw in our bags and piled on top of them. The Japanese hoisted the net and dumped us on the deck where a line of Japanese sailors were waiting with clubs. As we scrambled over each to get our bags, we were ordered to go below past the line of sailors. They did not hit us, but I learned that the enlisted men and civilians had been forced to run the gantlet of clubs. We were stopped at the foot of the ladder while our bags were inspected. I was afraid the inspector would not see the Japanese commander chop on my papers and leaned forward to point it out to him. A guard slapped me in the face as hard as he could. Nobody had ever slapped me before, and I was so surprised I could only gasp, which was probably lucky. By the time I recovered we had been shoved down two more ladders, and a Japanese was spraying us with disinfectant. We were not stripped, so I don't see that the spraying did anybody any good except the Japanese, who seemed to enjoy squirting the stuff on us. We were herded into a steel-walled compartment about thirty feet square. It had been the mail storage room when the ship was in commercial service. There were no portholes, not even a basin. The only furnishings were straw ticks which littered the floor and a raised platform that ran around the bulkhead. We bathed by wetting a rag with mouthwash and wiping our faces. We were fed twice a day, a meal of weak, tasteless rice gruel or a single small fish, sometimes with two olives or a piece of radish added as a special treat. The lights burned all the time, and all the time a guard with a bayonet stood at the open door to see that we did not whisper among ourselves. Once Captain Piat was accused of whispering, and the guard beat him with the stick. None of us tried to interfere. We were of the opinion that if we, as leaders, attempted resistance, the Japanese would not only execute us, but would murder many of our men. After five days of this, the Nitamaru reached Yokohama. Cunningham, Keane, Teeters and I were taken to a bitterly cold stateroom. There we shivered in our tropic clothing, while a Japanese, a member of the secret police, we thought, questioned us about the things the Japanese already knew. How many military on wake? How many civilians? The next day, eight officers and a dozen enlisted men were taken ashore. The officers were Major Putnam, Major Potter, Lieutenant Clewer and Gunner Borth of the Marines, and Commander Keane and Ensigns Olcott, Henshaw and Laugh of the Navy. We never knew why these officers were picked out. Later we guessed it was because they represented a cross-section of the Wake Establishment, the Defence Battalion, VMF 211, the Naval Air Station and Naval Communications. Most of the enlisted men selected were in communications, a further indication of the Japanese's special interest in our radio. There wasn't any time for farewells, nothing beyond, so long, we'll be seeing you one of these days. We had been ordered to surrender our watches and jewellery before reaching Yokohama, but Major Putnam had left his wristwatch hidden in the overhead. I found it after he was taken ashore. I wore it through our captivity and returned it to Putnam when we met in the States after our release. We sailed from Yokohama, January 19, and the next night the door of our prison was locked for the first time. The word was that a submarine was tracking us. If that submarine had sunk the Nitamaru, it would have been quite unpleasant. On January 23, the engines stopped. Nobody knew where we were. Then the officers were ordered on deck. I gawked at what I saw. We were tied up at the Bund in Shanghai. I had been there in 1930, and now I was so busy trying to identify landmarks that at first I hardly felt the raw, biting cold. Japanese and Chinese reporters came aboard, snapped pictures of us and gave us some cigarettes. Then we were herded below again, and next morning in the bitter cold we were marched ashore at Wusung, a few miles below Shanghai. There the Japanese army took us over from the navy. The Japanese had put up posters all along our route of march, inviting the Chinese to watch the parade of the captives, proof of the invincible valour of Japanese arms. But only a few of the Chinese paid any attention to us as we trudged on weak legs through the cold. The march was only four or five miles, but it was bad in our thin clothes after twelve days of kennel living and starvation rations in the prison ship. Gunner McKinstry's shoes were too big for him, and he was barely able to hobble on his blistered feet when we reached our destination, Wusung Prison Camp. 
Another American prisoner had been brought aboard before we dropped downriver from Shanghai to Wusung. He was Lieutenant Commander Columbus Smith, commanding officer of the gunboat Wake, which had been seized at Shanghai when the war started. Somebody said, The Wake, eh? What do you think of the name? I guess it's just unlucky, Commander Cunningham said. There may be more bleak and desolate places on this earth than Wusung prison camp, but I have never seen them. The prisoners' quarters were seven ramshackle barracks, each a long, narrow, one-story shanty into which the Japanese crowded two hundred men. At one end of each barracks was a wash rack and toilets. Facing the toilets, and much too close for sanitation, was a galley where food was prepared. The only other buildings on the barren wasteland of the camp area were administrative offices, guards' quarters and storerooms. The camp was surrounded by an electrified fence, and later, inside that fence, another electrified fence was erected around the barracks and the toilets. The prisoners slept on wooden platforms, and each man was given a straw tick and four blankets for his bedding. But four of those skimpy blankets were not half as warm as one ordinary American blanket. The jerry-built barracks gave little protection against the intense cold, and during the bitter winter we were soon pooling our blankets and sleeping four in a bunk to keep from freezing to death. The North China Marines who joined us at Wusung had winter uniforms, with overcoats, fur hats and gloves, but the rest of us had only the thin tropical uniforms we had brought from Wake. During the whole time of our captivity, the cold was our bitterest hardship, and our suffering was made worse because we never had enough to eat. Rice and tea were standard for all meals. The tea was made from willow leaves, and the rice was often so full of pebbles that prisoners broke their teeth trying to eat it. We also frequently had a weird stew, usually too thin for nourishment. When it was even thinner than usual, the sardonic marines called it tojo water. In addition, the Red Cross sent supplies every two weeks after the summer of 1942, and we also had what vegetables we could raise in our garden. The guards were brutal, stupid or both. They seemed to delight in every form of abuse, from petty harassment to sadistic torture, and if the camp authorities did not actually foster this cruelty, they did nothing to stop it. Of all the Japanese who had a crack at us in the six prison camps in which I was held during our captivity, the most insatiably brutal was Ishihara, a civilian interpreter. He had learned English in Honolulu, where he had gone to school, and later worked as a truck driver. He was about thirty-five, slightly built and wore horn-rimmed spectacles. The men he flogged, kicked and abused tagged him the Beast of the East. One of Ishihara's first victims at Wusung was Second Lieutenant Huizenga, a former football star at Annapolis. Huizenga, a North China Marine, had borrowed some tools from our own carpenter to make a few repairs in his quarters. Ishihara heard of it and snatched up a club. He rushed at Huisenga in a frenzy, clubbing him down, pounding him in wild fury until the helpless prisoner was unconscious. Then the panting Ishihara looked around him, smirking in triumph, safe under the rifles of the guards. Sir Mark Young, the British Governor-General of Hong Kong, also did something or other that angered Ishihara, possibly no more than failing to show properly servile respect for a Japanese civilian interpreter. This time Ishihara whipped out a sword, swinging it back to strike Sir Mark, but a Marine jumped him. Major Luther A. Brown, commander of the Marine barracks at Tientsin, twisted the sword out of Ishihara's hand and made the raging Japanese back down. For once, the Japanese officials did not back up a brutal underling. Colonel Yusei, the camp commandant, forbade Ishihara to carry a sword, probably more because Ishihara was a civilian than because of any desire to protect us. After that, Ishihara had to do his slashing of prisoners with a riding crop. When Colonel Yusa died in the fall of 1942, he was succeeded as camp commandant by Colonel Otera, whom the Marines dubbed Handlebar Hank because of his majestic moustache. He was a chronic drunk, and we heard that his love of the bottle was the reason Handlebar Hank was only a colonel, while many of his classmates at the officers' school were major generals and lieutenant generals. He didn't seem to mind, though. In fact, he didn't seem to mind anything so long as he could stay mellow. He didn't pay much attention to the prisoners or anything else in the camp, and his chauffeur became our best source of contraband, especially electric hot plates, which were strictly forbidden in the prisoners' barracks. Then there was Tiny Tim, 
a rambunctious officer whose favourite recreation was running us through surprise drills and inspections. Prisoners who had worked like slaves all day would be broken out at weird hours for fire drill or inspection, and there didn't seem to be anything we could do about it. But he finally sprung one fire drill too many, and one of the fire extinguishers happened to get out of control just as Tiny Tim was strutting past in his best uniform. He lost interest in surprise drills after that. Colonel William W. Ashurst of the North China Marines, as senior officer present, continually protested against infringements of international law in the treatment of the prisoners, but there was little else we could do to stop the petty persecution or even senseless cruelty of the Japanese guards. The prisoners could only take it in silence and store up hate in their hearts. The Japanese attitude toward us was, I think, most succinctly expressed in a Christmas address to prisoners by one Japanese commander. From now on, you have no property. You gave up everything when you surrendered. You do not even own the air that is in your bodies. From now on, you will work for the building of Greater Asia. You are the slaves of the Japanese. That is why Popeye stands out like a bright light in the memory of that black time. He was one of our guards, a young Formosan who had been a hotel clerk in civil life. He treated the prisoners like human beings. He secretly gave us cigarettes and even money to buy smuggled necessities, and he refused to accept anything in return. He was simply a decent man, which made him unique among the Japanese guards we encountered. I hope Popeye came through the war and I hope he fares well wherever he is. He rates it. The camp routine varied with the season, of course, but the chief difference was merely that in summer we got up earlier and stayed up later. Our day usually began at 5.30am. Immediately after the bugler sounded the discordant din of Japanese reveille, we were mustered in the barracks for roll call and inspection. Bunks had to be neat, blankets folded and shoes washed. We tried for months to explain to camp officials what a daily washing did to leather shoes, but they only shrugged. The order said that prisoners' shoes should be washed for inspection, and that was the way it would be as long as our shoes lasted. I was adjutant in charge of my barracks, and as the inspecting party arrived I would sing out, Kiwatsuki, attention, then Bango, count off I, and the men would shout, Ichi, ni, san, shai. When the inspecting party had left, I would order Yasume, rest, which was about the extent of our fluency in Japanese, despite an attempt by the camp director to make us learn the language. He formed classes for the American officers with compulsory attendance, but the classes met only twice. As was so often the case, the Japanese started enterprises with elaborate plans and then lost interest. I was reminded of Kipling's Bandar Log, after inspection, we had breakfast, and then the working parties of prisoners were formed, some being taken by trucks to labour on roads and other jobs outside of camp, while the rest worked in the camp garden, policed the grounds and buildings or washed their clothes. We had a dab of midday lunch, then more hours of work until supper was dished out about 6pm or whenever the outside working parties returned. Evening roll call was at 8.30pm, and taps sounded between 9pm and 11pm, depending on the season. Lights went out at taps. Then the hungry, weary prisoners lay in the dark, trying to forget the thoughts a man can't forget, hoping to sleep until the bugle called them out to slave again. That was our routine, our way of life for almost four years, except when it was worse. But all that is only part of the story of our captivity, the easiest part, Hidden behind the routine, under the surface of life in prison camp, was fought a war of wills for moral supremacy, an endless struggle, as bitter as it was unspoken, between the captors and the captives. The stake seemed to me simply this. The main objective of the whole Japanese prison programme was to break our spirit, and on our side was a stubborn determination to keep our self-respect whatever else they took from us. It seems to me that struggle was almost as much a part of the war as the battle we fought on Wake Island. This is how it went. At Wusung, the main task of the prisoners was road repair, but the Americans were so conscientiously slipshod in their work and so adept at the slowdown that the Japanese finally gave up. They assigned the prisoners to make a big camp garden instead, but after the seeds were planted there was not enough work to keep the men busy. There was nothing for them to do but loaf around, and we knew there was danger in that. Idleness in prison will break a man, 
so we tried to patch together a programme of activities to keep the men occupied, though there wasn't much we could do with our limited facilities. I obtained permission from the Japanese commander to start a school with American officers as teachers. We attempted to teach only high school subjects, and attendance was not compulsory, but men came. I don't know how much they learned, but it helped to pass the bleak days and keep our minds off our troubles. We laid out a baseball diamond, and some of the men took up whittling or built model planes, though we had only makeshift tools and materials for such handicraft. The camp's champion whittler was an old army man, a master sergeant, whose specialty was fancy cigarette holders. Such was our shortage of consumer goods that he sold all he could make. The Japanese, masters of life and death, overlooked no chance, however petty, to strike at our pride, to try to make us lose face. Typical was the order that we must salute Japanese non-coms as we did their officers. We found a way out of that. We simply failed to obey except when a Japanese non-com was officer of the day, which was in accord with accepted military custom. I have heard of cases where the Japanese executed prisoners for less than that, but for some reason the Japanese at Wusung did not press the point. We were short of everything, of course, food and clothing and everything else, but we would have been far worse off had it not been for the American and British residents of Shanghai. They sent us books and whatever else they could spare. I remember especially Mrs. Percy Shelley Widdup, whom we came to know as Aunt B. She informally adopted fourteen of the Wake Island officers, and sent us food and knitted wear that was worth more than any money when winter came. The Japanese made a great fuss about the number of gifts she sent, but they finally let her parcels pass after she explained that all fourteen of us were her nephews. When our first Red Cross boxes arrived at Christmas 1942, a year after our capture, we found the Japanese had looted them. Red Cross food was even seen on the camp commandant's shelves. Colonel Ashurst finally stopped such thefts by refusing to sign for the boxes as senior officer unless the prisoners got them intact. Altogether, each of us received seventeen and one-half Red Cross boxes, and it is only stating a simple fact to say that these boxes saved our lives. The food and the medical supplies we got from home and from our friends in Shanghai enabled our prisoner doctors to keep our death rate during that time about what it would have been in an ordinary community. The food saved us, yes, but as bad as our hunger for food was the hunger for news from home. Not knowing is almost as bad as anything you have to face in prison camp. A man begins to wonder, beating his brains, dreaming up dark things and brooding on them, wondering and worrying, and finally he's licked. That is when he loses the battle to keep his pride. The Japanese refused to let us write home until more than six months after we had been taken prisoner. We did not get our first mail from home until the fall of 1942, almost a year after the surrender. In all, we got mail from home only about a dozen times. Sometimes the Japanese censored our letters by cutting out passages. Sometimes they confiscated the entire letter without letting the prisoner know that somebody had written to him. The Japanese also made a practice of holding up our mail after it had arrived. I know that one big batch of mail arrived for us in November 1943, and the Japanese delayed giving all of it to us until March 1944. That may seem a petty persecution, but to men in prison camp it was torture. Men who were brave in battle have cried in the dark because they didn't get a letter. Exhausted men have lain all night staring at the raw ceiling, trying to stop wondering what's happening at home. It's just one last thing on top of all the rest. We had one strong weapon to use against the breaking of pride. That is why we insisted from the start on maintaining military discipline among the prisoners. It was the only way we could continue as a military organisation and not become a mob. It was only by maintaining the officer's status that we could properly represent our men in dealing with the Japanese and get things for them from our captors. And it was only by maintenance of discipline as a military organisation that we were able to keep our morale through the years of our captivity. My insistence on saluting in prison camp may seem absurd to some, but I know that in prison camp, when the military personnel exchanged salutes, it made us feel that despite our ragged clothes and empty bellies, we were still a part of something the Japanese couldn't break. It helped us keep our pride, our self-respect, our sense of maintaining a code in the face of disaster.
In spite of everything, we still belonged. A serious problem in prison camp, as in any place where men live in such close proximity, was created by conflict of personalities and ideas among ourselves. Of course, more often than not, these disagreements turned molehills into mountains because of the conditions of our life. But here against the maintenance of discipline solved our problem. It kept us united in our opposition to the Japanese attempts to break us. Every time a draft of prisoners was taken away, I gave each man an identification paper. It was just a slip typed out by the clerk saying that Private First Class So-and-So was a member of the Wake Island Detachment of the 1st Marine Defence Battalion. In my presence, the man signed his identification paper, and I certified it by my signature. It didn't mean much, of course, probably nothing in itself, but I felt it was a straw of group identity to which a man could cling no matter where he went. It was something to remind him he was an American and a Marine, still part of something and not alone, whatever the Japanese did to him. There are men who still treasure those scraps of paper. None of us ever doubted that America would win the war, but sometimes a man might wonder whether he would be alive to see the end. We knew so little at first of what was happening beyond the electric fence that was the boundary of our world. Old newspapers reached us once in a while, and each one passed from hand to hand until it was shredded. The Japanese also allowed us to have a radio in each barracks, but the radios were set so we could receive only from the French, German and Russian stations in Shanghai, which made English broadcasts. Soon, however, we were secretly receiving broadcasts from the States. I don't know how it was done and I never asked. You learn not to ask questions about a thing like that in prison camp. All I know is that Lieutenant Kinney took our barracks radio and tinkered with it, and after that he was able to tell us the day's news from the States. There was not much to make us cheerful in the news that spring of 1942, except for Doolittle's raid. But then came that wonderful day when Kinney told us about the Battle of the Coral Sea. I mentioned that the Japanese allowed us to write our first letters home in the summer of 1942. I wrote to my wife and my son Paddy. The International Red Cross notified my wife in June that I was alive, but before my letter reached her, she had died. It was August before I learned of her death from the Red Cross. The Japanese officials expressed their sympathy and told me I could knock off work for three days if I had the proper attitude, whatever that meant. I believe they were trying to do the right thing, but as usual they succeeded only in being clumsy and intrusive. It was April 1943, almost a year after my wife's death, before I was allowed to write to Paddy. He was nine and was living with my wife's parents, Colonel and Mrs J. P. Welch, at the army post on Governor's Island. I print this letter here because it was part of my life in prison camp and because it is a compromised document. Having been given to the press at the time, it no longer has the character of privacy intended when I wrote it. Dear Paddy, our loss must have indeed been a shock to you. It was to me. We both loved her so much. I only wish that I could be with you, but you are indeed fortunate to have your grandparents to watch over you. I made a broadcast recording to you last fall, do hope you received it in view of the fact that this is my first letter to you. Impossible to write more often. In your mother's letter, she said you were doing well in church and school. Keep up the good work. You will find both extremely necessary in later life. Since I can't do it, will you please ask your grandmother to have you given swimming and riding lessons? I do not care how well you are able to perform when I return, but I do want you to like riding. You will have to help me school horses when we get our farm. Speaking of farming, I am learning quite a bit about it. We have textbooks and practical experience, plus lots of advice. Your mother wrote you were throwing your weight around the post on account of the Wake Island Marines. They did quite well, and I am proud of them. But remember that it just so happened we were there. Anyone else would have done the same. You must remember that the work done behind the lines is often more vital than at the front. You can see from the enclosed picture which was taken this winter that I am well as are most of us. Of course, we would like to be going home, and if an exchange is made, we should be among the first. Please write as often as possible. My only letters were dated last June. I suppose you were able to be with your cousins for a while last summer, and imagine that you will get to Chevy Chase this coming summer. As I have written before, I would like you to visit any of your cousins whenever it is possible. Be sure and write everyone saying you have heard from me and give them my love.
your affectionate father, Daddy. In December 1942, after a guerrilla sniper shot a Japanese sentry at Wusung, we were marched to another prison camp five miles away at Kiangwang. The camp was almost a duplicate of Wusung, but the Marines remember Kiangwang as the worst hellhole of our captivity because of the Mount Fuji project. That was the Marines' name for a construction job on which they were forced to slave 12 hours a day, six days a week, under Ishihara's sadistic supervision. The project was ostensibly a recreation park, but actually a rifle range, and Ishihara drove the prisoners so brutally that weakened men began to drop, unable to stand the merciless pace. Ishihara only drove the others harder. Most of the prisoners had no money except what they were paid for working. The pay varied according to rank, with officers getting more than enlisted personnel. As Chinese money was practically worthless, a private had to work three days to earn the price of ten cigarettes or a small loaf of Japanese bread. Some of the prisoners, especially the North China Marines, were more fortunate. They had been able to bring in American currency, with which they could buy Chinese money, or military yen, in which all purchases had to be made. But the official rate was so low that they refused to part with their American dollars and snooped around for a black market. They found one through the Chinese coolies at Mount Fuji. Ishihara got his cut for winking at this black market dealing, but he was so greedy that he kept insisting on more and more until the men shut down on him. Then he squealed to the camp officials and demanded an investigation to stamp out the iniquitous practice. That was the beginning of the worst inquisition of our captivity. Lieutenant Foley, a Navy medical officer from Tientsin, was one of the first called for questioning. After the questioning, he was carried out on a stretcher, unconscious. Suspected prisoners, officers and men were called to the torture. They were beaten until they could not stand. Men's thumbs were twisted until it seemed they were being torn off. Some were given the water cure. A tube was jabbed into their mouths and water was poured down it until they fainted. Not one of them admitted anything. Colonel Ashurst and I were among the few officers who escaped interrogation. His seniority spared him, but the only reason I have ever been able to guess for my own escape was the fact that I speak a little French. Colonel Otera, the drunken camp commandant, also spoke a little, and he liked to exchange a few words of French with me during his inspections. I think the sight of us chatting together in French convinced the dumb guards that I was somehow under his special protection, and so they skipped me. The Japanese finally pieced together the story of the Mount Fuji black market, or part of it, from the confessions of Chinese go-betweens and information given by a white mouse among our civilian prisoners. The prisoners they named as guilty were put in the brig overnight and confined to barracks for a month. The white mouse's reward for squealing was promotions to honcho or straw boss, but none of the other prisoners ever spoke to him again. By the summer of 1943, the Mount Fuji project was breaking the men's health. Tuberculosis spread, and even those men still on their feet were hardly more than skin and bones. I remember one prisoner whose waistline shrank eight inches under the Japanese system of reducing. Commander Leo Thyssen, Marine Corps, United States Navy, our senior medical officer, segregated the tuberculosis patients and insisted that they have complete rest, but that was all we could do for them. We were never able to obtain medical instruments so that our doctors could collapse the diseased lungs, though these instruments were available in the cosmopolitan city of Shanghai. When the Mount Fuji project was finished, a blessed day for the prisoners, some of them were assigned to work at a gasoline and alcohol dump. There they combined sabotage with pleasure by tapping the Japanese alcohol supply for beverage purposes. The problem of getting the purloined alcohol from the dump to the prisoners' barracks was solved by a marine who stole a section of inner tube from the tyre repair shop. He sealed one end of the tube, filled it with alcohol, sealed the other end, and then wore it like a girdle as he passed empty-handed and unsuspected past the watchful guards. As we officers had feared, the men were not in physical shape to handle alcohol, and it wasn't long before a marine was caught drunk. When he was sober enough to talk, the Japanese insisted that he tell them why he had stolen the alcohol. It's like this, he said. I've got aches in my bones and I need it for massage. The Japanese not only swallowed the tail, but let him take along a bottle of alcohol for massage while he was in the brig, 
which made him the most envied man in camp, brig or no brig. Only a week or so after his release from the brig, this marine was again found intoxicated. A second offence was such a serious matter that he was hauled up before Colonel Otera himself. And what, demanded the outraged Colonel, should be done with such a habitual offender? The Marine replied, I don't know, sir, I reckon you better shoot me. Colonel Otera was so flabbergasted that he let the prisoner off with a warning. During the whole period of our captivity, I suppose the most constant thought in the mind of any prisoner was his chances of escape. The first attempt after our arrival at Wusung was made by five prisoners in March 1942. Two of the five were from Wake Island, Commander Cunningham and Mr. Teeters. They crawled under the electrified fence and struck out a foot across country in the hope of finding one of the Chinese guerrilla bands. But they were caught within 24 hours and brought back to Wusung. The five prisoners were paraded as a warning to the rest of us before being taken to Shanghai for trial. The military personnel were sentenced to ten years' close confinement in prison for the crime of desertion from the Japanese army. Commander Cunningham took the risk of attempting to escape because he had information which he considered of great importance to our navy, but I had no such incentive. Quartermaster Clerk Paul Chandler, now Lieutenant Colonel of United States Marine Corps, subsequently took back to Washington the only contribution I could make to our military intelligence. Chandler had been taken prisoner in Shanghai. He was a Marine, but he had diplomatic status because he was attached to the consular service to complete negotiations for property sales after the 4th Marines had been evacuated from Shanghai before the outbreak of war. Some time after the Shanghai prisoners joined us, the word went around that prisoners with diplomatic status and some civilians would soon be repatriated. So I had a little private talk with Chandler. I gave him our casualty figures and a list of our dead and told him to inform headquarters. I also told him to report orally how the Japanese had succeeded in their final attack by landing at night and without naval gunfire support. A little later, the prisoners to be repatriated were put under close guard. I suppose it was to prevent us sending messages, but again the Japanese were a little too late. Consequently, I did not consider myself justified in making an attempt to escape since I was one of the senior marine officers. I considered it my duty to stay with my men as long as I could, to maintain discipline and morale, to represent them to the Japanese authorities, and to keep as many of them as I could alive until the war was over. I realised my decision was hardly in the adventure yarn tradition, but I feel that events justified it. Anyway, nobody ever made good an escape from Wusung or Qiangwang. We were now able to follow the progress of the war fairly well through radios surreptitiously constructed of odds and ends and bailing wire, and from news brought to camp by fresh drafts of prisoners. We were elated but not greatly surprised when B-29s began to bomb Japanese installations around Shanghai in the winter of 1944. Our big thrill came in the spring of 1945, when a flight of P-51s passed over us so low that we waved to the pilots. Army fighter planes meant that Americans had established a base not too far away. For the first time in three years, I heard Marines whistling as they worked. The more the American planes struck, the more hysterical our guards became. When the air raid warning sounded, they would herd us into the barracks, jabbing with their bayonets and screaming at us. Once they lost their heads so completely that they fired at raiding planes from the windows of our barracks. This was a violation of the rules of war, but their terrified, ineffectual fire did more to amuse us than to arouse our indignation. Early in May, leaving behind about two dozen tubercular and mental cases, the Japanese began moving us 700 miles northward to Fangtai near Peking. They loaded us into freight cars for the trip. The officers were lucky. Only 25 of us were put in each car, while enlisted men and civilians were crammed in 50 to the car, none of which was big enough to allow 50 men to lie down at the same time. The middle section of each car between the sliding doors was wired off to keep the prisoners in the end sections from rushing the guards. Each car had four small windows, also covered with wire. At night, each car was lit by a single oil lamp. Men soon noticed that if clothing were hung in a certain way near the lamp, one window at a time could be screened from the light. Then they noticed that the wires across the windows were loose, the guards were drowsing, 
and the train was making barely 20 miles an hour. The next night, the train jerked suddenly to a stop. Enraged Japanese officers clambered in with drawn pistols and swords, squealing in rage as they counted heads and spouted threats. We learned later that five officers had escaped through the window of the car ahead. Lieutenants Kinney and McAllister, of the Wake Islanders, Huizenga and McBrayer, of the North China Marines, and Bishop, a flying tiger. Colonel Otera was so outraged that he announced he was placing himself under arrest. Elaborate precautions were taken to prevent any further escape. The windows were wedged, and an officer with a drawn sword took his post in the guard section of each car. But the next night two civilian prisoners escaped. One of the civilians was recaptured, and so viciously abused that he suffered a breakdown. But the other civilian and the five officers made their way safely across country to friendly troops. The escaped prisoners separated as they fled from the train but were reunited after reaching guerrilla bands of Chinese communists. During the next 47 days, they travelled about 700 miles by foot, horse and boat, through and around Japanese territory. In a report made after his return to the States, Lieutenant McAllister said that with the Chinese communists, they travelled 33 days in enemy territory, hitherto without United States or Kuomintang observers. In this area of the Chinese communists, our treatment was excellent, the communists gave us food, medicine, clothing and dollar one hundred thousand in Chinese currency. We visited most of their factories, schools, hospitals and army and guerrilla units. The Americans were passed on to nationalist troops and, for a period of fourteen days while in Kuomintang territory, we were accorded excellent treatment by nationalist government troops behind the enemy lines. Here again we attended war rallies and visited army units along our path, it took our train five days to reach Feng Tai, where we found fewer facilities and worse food than at Wusung or Qiangwang. On June 19, we began another boxcar trip, this time of four days to the port of Fusan in Korea. We arrived in a cloudburst and had to march three miles through ankle-deep mud to camp. Some of the prisoners were elderly, all were weak, but the Japanese kept prodding us on, refusing to let us try to help men who slipped and fell in the mud. I still can't forget a one-legged pilot trying to hobble through the mud on crude crutches we had made for him. Fusan was worse than Feng Tai. We had to brush away swarms of flies with one hand while we tried to eat with the other. The food was like garbage. Almost all of us had dysentery. The third day after our arrival, they marched us to the docks and packed us into the fetid, airless lower deck of a ferry steamer. The twelve-hour passage to Honshu, Japan's main island, was worse than our nine days in the boxcars. Then we were loaded into day coaches, 170 prisoners jammed into a car built to hold 88. The guards made us keep the blinds drawn, but we managed to steal glimpses of the country through which we were passing. For miles along both sides of the tracks there was nothing left except rubble and ruin. Weak and worn as we were, the sight made us grin at each other. We knew only that we were going north. We got a change of rations. Instead of raw fish with our rice, the guards gave us cooked food, fried grasshoppers. By train and ferry, we finally reached Takagawa on Kokkaido, July 6. There, 35 of us officers were separated from the men. We were being taken to another camp. I barely had time to remind the men that they must stick together, that they must maintain discipline as marines, when we were taken on to Nishiyashibetsu some 20 miles from Takagawa. We found 45 Australian officers already there. They had been captured at Rabaul and were only shambling skeletons after their years of captivity in the prison camp at Zentsuji. When the Japanese made us volunteer for manual labour, the Australians were the first to agree because it meant they would be given an extra ration of rice. We were put to work clearing ground for a garden, but within a month most of the officers were transferred to a lumber yard and set to carrying timbers and gravel to a nearby coal mine. Enlisted men from the camps around us were forced to work underground at the mines in shifts of 12 and 14 hours a day. We did not hear about the atomic bomb. One day, Lieutenant Commander Gree and I passed some British Tommies as we came back from work. One of the Tommies said, We're having a bowl of caviar tonight. We were told another Tommy had muttered to an officer, Sir, Joe is in. That was how we learned that Russia had declared war on Japan.
The guards began singing a softer tune. They even allowed us to swim in the river below camp. There, a Japanese soldier confided to us in schoolboy English, very soon we will all be friends again. The Japanese had a radio in their office in our barracks, but we never knew what the announcer was saying. One day the Japanese began crowding into the office. There were even women pressing in to hear the radio. A prisoner said, They're gathering all their people for it. It must be something big. We sat listening to the blaring radio, wondering what the announcer was jabbering, and then we heard a woman scream. She worked in their galley. Now she was screaming and sobbing at what she had heard. As they left, all the Japanese looked sick. One of us said, Something sure as hell has happened. That was August 14. The Japanese had just heard the announcement of Japan's surrender. But nobody told us about it. All they did was announce that next day there would be no working parties. Then it seemed that every day was Christmas. Our cigarette ration had started at ten a day at Wusung and had shrunk to nothing. Now the cigarette ration was restored. We started getting some decent food, vegetables and even sugar. The guards became steadily more friendly. We knew the war had taken a big change, but we got the impression it was only some sort of armistice because the Japanese didn't relinquish control. They only relaxed their strictness little by little. The captive officers still went on wood-gathering details, still cooked their own food, still policed their heads. Then, on August 18, an English-speaking Japanese officer announced to the prisoners, We have decided to stop fighting, though our army has not been beaten in the field. Some of us were allowed to go to a house nearby where a Japanese translated Japanese newspapers for us. But even then we did not know Japan had surrendered conditionally. The translator told us the Japanese would keep their homeland and that the emperor would remain in power. He gave us the idea that it was a negotiated peace, and we didn't learn the truth until August 20 when the international Red Cross representatives arrived at our camp. Before the Red Cross men arrived, the Japanese rigged up a first aid room in our barracks. They fitted it with medical equipment none of us had ever seen before and blandly pretended that it had been there all the time for the benefit of the prisoners. We were burning to start home, but the word was passed that we would remain in the camps until records could be checked and transportation arranged. We had been taking over the camp administration little by little, and about September 5, I went over to one of the men's camps. Most of the prisoners there were my men, and took command. Private First Class H.D. Lorenz had taken such excellent care of me during our long imprisonment. Among the first of my men I saw was my former orderly, Private First Class H.D. Lorenz, doing what he could for me when not forced to work for the Japanese. One night the Japanese gave a dinner party for us at the Mine Officials Club. We went because we felt that perhaps it would reassure the Japanese people that we were not the ruthless barbarians their propagandists had insisted throughout the war. Possibly that might help a little in peaceful occupation of the country, if that were a condition of the surrender. Our incomplete information still lead us to believe that only a few strategic points would be taken over. Our Japanese hosts were generous with good food and wine, but then the top official had the gall to propose a toast to everlasting friendship between American and Japan. Major Brown of the North China Marines responded. He stood silent a moment, looking at them, remembering Ishihara, remembering the starvation and torture of our men, remembering the arrogant brutality of these people who were now fawning on us. He told them, If you behave yourselves, you'll get fair treatment. A couple of American rescue teams arrived about September 10 and seemed a little disappointed that we were getting along so well. We had a radio receiver in operation and the first of our men were being started home. As instructed, I sent first the sick, the British and American merchant marine officers and some service personnel under Gunner McKinstry, the remainder were scheduled to leave September 14. In response to a message from Rear Admiral Beauty Martin, I went to Chitosi Airfield and took off in a Navy plane September 15. When I stepped out of that plane on the deck of Admiral Martin's flagship, the escort carrier Hoggart Bay, I felt American soil under my feet for the first time since our surrender. There I was met by an old friend, Captain Joe Briggs, and then I dined as Admiral Martin's guest, the Admiral is a fine host, but for my first American meal he served me rice. Admiral Fighting Jack Fletcher, commanding the North Pacific Fleet, put me up overnight on his flagship 
and then I picked up some Wake Island officers in Tokyo and took off for home. We were at Guam, September 17, Pearl Harbor, September 19, and Washington, September 26. That is bluntly factual, but I do not think any man who was a prisoner of the Japanese will ever be able to put down in words what he felt on coming home. One thing I could not get over was the way we were treated by everybody, even by people we had never met. I think it was summed up for all of us by Colonel Samuel Howard, now Major General, who commanded the 4th Marines on Bataan and Corregidor, when he said, If this keeps up, they'll kill us with kindness. But for me, the high point was a single moment when I reached Washington. There was a crowd, kinsmen, old friends and a lot of others. But in that moment, the only person I saw was my son Paddy coming toward me. I suppose that some day, in the normal course of events in the service, I shall return to Hawaii for another tour of duty. When that day comes, after paying my official calls, the first thing I will do will be to hunt up a friend of mine who deserves a place in any story of Wake Island. He is Ambrose C. Lum, Honorary Private First Class United States Marines. Ambrose is of Chinese descent, but as a native of Honolulu, he is an American citizen, a fact he proudly announced when he appeared at my command post to make himself useful as an orderly and handyman when the war began. Ambrose adopted the Marines as his own, especially Corporal Robert Massey Brown, and I heard him call their attention to the fact that his feet were larger than those of the average Chinese. He explained that his feet were larger because, as an American citizen, he always had plenty of good milk, butter and eggs. Ambrose didn't like bombs any better than the rest of us, but he didn't bother to hide his feeling. He was a quick man into a hole when the bombers came. One day, as we ducked for shelter, Ambrose noticed that Corporal Brown was missing. Where's Bob? he cried. Where's Bob? Somebody mentioned that Corporal Brown had slipped off into the brush for a little nap. Ambrose burst out, he'll be killed. A moment later, despite his fear of bombs, Ambrose was streaking out into the brush to find his friend. He awoke the sleeping corporal as the first bombs came whistling down. They had only seconds to spare as they sprinted for cover. After the raid, they returned to the spot to get Corporal Brown's gear. They found a bomb crater where Brown had left his blankets. Ambrose went to prison camp with us, and there, as a Chinese, he became an invaluable contact with the black market from which he smuggled necessities and such small luxuries as we could afford. He could have gouged the American prisoners for his own profit, but he never did. When the Japanese started their inquisition into the black market, Ambrose was promised immunity if he would turn up the Marines involved. He insisted he knew nothing. They beat him until he was unconscious, and they gave him the water cure, forcing water down his gagging throat until he fainted but they never got a word out of him. Then they tried kindness, trying to persuade him that he was an Asiatic, that we were his enemies, that he would benefit in privileges if he put the finger on the guilty Americans. All they got out of him, even when they flogged him again, was a defiant, I may be a yellow man like you, but I'm an American citizen. You better be careful what you do to me. The Japanese finally gave Ambrose up as a bad job. It was for this, more than for his endless wangling for our benefit, that some of the Marines decided to show their gratitude in the only way they could. They elected him an honorary private first class in the United States Marine Corps. They tell me that there were tears in Ambrose's eyes when he was informed of it. After that, Ambrose got his great idea. He had been in the canary bird business before he went to wake, and he had a lot of money safe in the bank in Honolulu, when he got home, he said, he would open a new business. It would be the most exclusive bar in the world. The name would be the Wake Island Marine Bar. The only customers who would ever be admitted would be Marines or the guests of Marines. As Honorary Private First Class Lum explained to Corporal Brown in prison camp, I want to show I feel the honour. Anyhow, Marines got to stick together. I shall ask Ambrose to join me in the first drink.